Hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Cal Workman. I am the events and program librarian for the Manchester Community Library. I'm so happy you're able to join us this evening for our talk, uh, What's It Worth? An Evening with Notable Rare Book Appraiser, Ken Gloss. Before I introduce Ken, I want to point out that we are recording this talk and we'll be airing it later on both GNAT TV viewing platforms and on our own YouTube channel. Um, give us a little time to edit it though and put it together, but in a couple of weeks, it should be available for you to enjoy or share with friends. In the final edited version, your face or your screen will not appear, and we've done that for your privacy. Um, Ken's going to talk to us for about 45 minutes so we can leave room for some Q&A and for some book appraisals. And while Ken is talking, please feel free to use the chat function on the bottom of the screen, post questions, comments. Um, I'll be referring to that later for Ken. Um, and I also have posted in the chat already for you his website address and his email address. And I believe he in, in invites you to be in touch. Um, so with that, I'm happy to introduce Ken Gloss, the proprietor of the internationally known Brattle Bookshop in Boston. It is one of America's oldest and largest antiquarian bookstores with over 100,000 titles and 6,000 square feet of space. Ken worked in the store since childhood and took over management from his late father, George Gloss, in 1985 choosing to pursue a career in the book business instead of pursuing a doctorate in chemistry, I understand. The list of professional associations to which Ken is a member is long and includes the Antiquarian Bookseller Association of America and the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers. He is frequently called upon to appraise books discovered on the popular PBS program, Antiques Roadshow, and tonight, we look forward to hearing some stories about what makes a book or other ephemera collectible. He will tell us some stories from his, the bookstore and his hunt for treasures, along with some tips. Um, he will also give a few on-the-spot evaluations of books selected from what the audience members have sent to him in advance. This is Ken's second visit to Manchester community, and we are so delighted to welcome him back with us again tonight. Thank you. and. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, I suppose when we do Zoom talks, they're a little different than doing them live. And one of the big differences, I don't get to go skiing tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> like I did the last time I was there. But I'll look forward to this pandemic getting over and maybe coming up and actually doing a live talk. The other thing it does is usually when I do live talks, I talk and at the end, I just stay around for half an hour. I can do 100 appraisals in 15 or 20 minutes. It's a lot harder to do it. So I do a few limited. But if anybody has any questions, appraisals, uh, questions about appraisals, you can always get in touch through the bookstore, email, phone. And if you like the stories I tell, I do do a podcast called Brattlecast. And I release a new one every two weeks. So. But with that, what I try to do in a talk is I don't really try to teach that much about books because I find that I can put an audience asleep in no time if you get too technical. But I try to tell stories about books, book collecting, things people have brought in, things that we've seen, and, uh, and just sort of give a feel for what it is. Now, uh, let me give a little bit of my background and history to Scott, and then I'll go on with the anecdotes. Uh, the history of the store goes back to the 1820s, but for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married, my mother had $500, and with that, they bought half interest in the store. And my father built the store with his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge. He was also a bit of a character and a showman. And uh, we've always been in Boston. People hear the name Brattle, they think of Harvard Square. Uh, there used to be a little side street in what was Scully Square uh, in Boston where the store was. Now to make it even more difficult, the street doesn't even exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And we've had seven different locations over the years, uh, mainly due to urban renewal. And my father would move the store 
When it was planned, he'd move the best books to the new location and then run sales, half price dollar, 50 cent quarter dime. Last day of the sale though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bag, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, people would go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this, we were on, um, we, it was in 1969, and we were moving to the West Street where we are now, but at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team. Uh, they filled it up with books and they drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He had gotten his point across. He used to say that he cast his books to the waters and they came back a thousandfold. But we've been on West Street since 1969. When we first moved in, we were in uh, a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building filled with books. In 1980, I got a call at five o'clock in the morning, the building was on fire and it literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone, but we wanted to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. We rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books and we opened within a month. Now it was just barely a stock. But the main thing was just keep going. Uh, over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt our business in the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is again, a few doors down on West Street. And it's sort of the old Dickensian type of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general used books, third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, sell books, but particularly uh, in the inner cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I can assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have been going out of business. And in the last few years, the internet has speeded that process along and this last year, I can say, has been a challenge, to say the least. Uh, you know, next to our store, uh, we were talking before the, uh, we started that we have an empty lot where we have outside books at a dollar, three, and five dollars. Sort of the overflow, the cheap. I almost say it's like the pressure valve on the store, because we go out to estates and houses almost every day. It's almost like being treasure on Treasure Island and Jim Hawkins. But we buy thousands of books. And if we didn't have the outside with the cheaper books, I, I know the store would just explode. So it's sort of our pressure valve. And the empty lot next to the store is where the old store had burnt down. So that's why we happen to have an empty lot. But sort of the used and rare book business, a lot of people, one of the things they come into it, maybe the way people go into running a restaurant maybe the way they go into uh, running an inn in Vermont. It sounds great, but it's a lot of work. I mean, and maybe because I've done this all my life. I mean, it was my parents' store. My parents say my first word was book. I don't know, maybe it was, but, uh, but I'm sure they were talking about them. And then I did work after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I do have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. I was going to get a doctoral to the University of Wisconsin, but in 1973, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now has been 48 years, and I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. But what people don't realize about the running a business, it's a business. And one of the things about a business is for all of the fun and all of the interesting things and all of the, you got to make money. 
<laughs> Good. And, uh, and also the other thing that people don't realize, it's an incredibly physical job. I mean, if you buy a thousand books from a, in a fifth floor walk up apartment in 95 degree heat, you've got to carry a thousand books out of a fifth floor apartment in 95 degree heat. As a matter of fact, when we're hiring, our uh, job interview goes, it starts like this. Do you have any injuries? Do you have any back injuries, leg injuries, knee injuries, sports injuries? Uh, is there any reason you can't lift 40, 50 pound boxes? Then the next question is, do you have any allergies to dust, mold, mildew? And we go through all of that. And then we go, well, where did you go to school? What's your background? Uh, do you have any, uh, you know, uh, literary? Uh, and so all of that is sort of secondary because all of that we can teach somebody, uh, but we can't make them not allergic. Uh, and, you know, and it's fun. And one of the things is though, I get to work very early in the morning. Usually I walk in at around 5.30 and my wife says, I only work half a day, 12 hours. And, uh, but the main thing it's fun and you go out and it's a lot of the people. And when I was saying we're hiring, and I'm just going to start getting into, uh, I'll sort of show you this. One of the things that I do um, is I have a lot of stories. I don't collect books that much. I will tell about one collection that we have and maybe one that my wife has. But what I do collect is stories. And I have sheet after sheet with one sentence. I mean, I literally have all of these sheets with either one sentence or one line. And every one of those is a story. And I assure you, I can't get through them all tonight. But uh, when I was saying we hire people, and sometimes it's the people we hire that can be really interesting. About, oh, this was a long time ago. I hired an, an employee uh, and he had just been working at the store for a week. And an older man came in the store. Now that older man is probably younger than I am now, but an older man came in the store and he asked for an author named Donifred Yates. And it's an obscure novelist. I knew who it was. I, we went to the section. I looked for the Donifred Yates. There wasn't any. I said to the man, do you want to leave your name? He said, no, uh, uh, I'll just check back some other time. And he leaves. And my new employee, who only been working a few days, he goes, does that man come in here often? And I said, you know, I really wasn't paying attention. But no, I didn't recognize him. He goes, oh, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. So you never know with your employees what you're going to get. And this employee, and again, it's more the people in the stories, gave one of the introductions once that I remember and I never have forgotten. About a month after he worked for us, my wife and I had four baseball, uh, basketball tickets. Uh, and we had two extra and we were going and we said, Hugh, do you want a couple of tickets to the basketball game? Well, and he says, yes, but give me the tickets. I'll meet you there. Um, and so my wife and I got there. He's sitting there with a woman. We walk in and he goes, oh, I'd like you to meet my wife, Mickey. We're getting divorced tomorrow. And you have to admit, it's an introduction that you don't forget. And they both said, hi, how are you? And all this. So this so it can be the employees and the people coming in. But a lot of it is the hunt and the search. It's going out. Like I say, I feel like I'm Jim Hawkins. Just today, I went to two estates. Yesterday, I went to three estates. Uh, next uh, Thursday, I have to drive up to Kenny Bunkport, Maine to look at two or 3,000 books on Buddhist history. Uh, another time, I might go to an estate and be looking at philosophy or religion or science. Uh, and some of the things that you get to touch and hold, some of the things that you don't expect. Uh, I one time went to an estate and this was in Dracut, which is just north of Boston near Lowell. And it was a little world, I got called. They said they had some things. I don't remember what they said they had, but it was enough to get me to go. And I walk into this estate and it's an, a World War II ranch house, very simple, 
you walk in, it hadn't been redecorated since it was new. There was a Formica kitchen table. There was a big roll of paper on the kitchen table. Turned out that roll of paper was the manuscript for On the Road. Kerouac, when he wrote it, wrote it on a teletype because he just wrote it stream of consciousness. And sitting on that table, unbeknownst to me until I got there, was the original manuscript for On the Road. I got to pick it up. I unrolled it a few feet. It was too fragile to roll, unroll more than that. Uh, I didn't get to buy it, but they sold it at auction for two and a half million dollars. But I got to pick up and touch and hold the manuscript for On the Roll Road. And that's one of the great things. And you never forget what you have. Um, and, and even though I've done this a long time, I one time got called by a museum to do an appraisal. Now, I do hundreds of pre appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me in the bridal bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, but if you think of me in the bridal bookshop, and one of the ways I feel I can do that is by giving out as much free information as reasonable. But there are times when I discuss uh, if it's very formal, written for insurance, estate taxes, I discuss a fee. Any case, this was for a museum in Boston that I really like. I said, look, I'll do this appraisal for free, but I don't wanna do it from your website. I don't wanna do it from a copy. I wanna see the actual item. Uh, it was for insurance. They were loaning it to another museum and they needed an insurance loan while it was out of their possession. What it was, and I was holding it, a four page handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. So I'm sitting there holding Paul Revere's own account that he wrote out a week after the ride and you're reading it. Uh, and the, the British told me to get off or they'd blow my head off. And the, but you're touching something like that. And even though I deal with this, you touch a document that George Washington held, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Albert Einstein, or so many others, and you still touch it. And you say, these, pers these people actually touched this paper, held it, held it down, and you're touching this something that it still sends a tingle up your spine. Now, one of the things that I, I will mention, this is on net on Netflix right now, and it, it's an interesting story. It's called Murder, Murder Among the Mormons. And sometimes people ask me about forgeries and documents and how can you tell if they're real? Uh, I'll do an aside, I'll, I'll answer that question. First of all, 99% of what people ask you to identify in uh, is it real or not real? is real because nobody would ever forge it. It's not worth forging. <laughs> it doesn't have value. Uh, so therefore, in most cases, people won't forge things. Uh, but occasionally they will. And, and the reality is the best forgers of all time, you would never know it because it had, by definition, they'd be so good, you'd never know it was forged. But there was a man and he actually had come into a store. This was back in the mid eighties. He had been in our store a few times. I didn't know him well, but he was selling wonderful and very unknown documents of all types, but particularly he was from Utah and selling Mormon documents. And he was selling some, and since they were from Vermont, originally a few of them where Joseph Smith came from, uh, some of them were actually calling into question the foundations of the Mormon church. He found letters that questioned the, the golden tablets and questioned all of this and how Joseph Smith found them. And what he was doing was brilliant in a way. He was selling them to the Mormon church who didn't want anybody to see them. So if you forge something, you want to get a document that you sell to somebody, you make a good profit, and they seal it away and put it away and don't let anybody look at it. Now, the really unfortunate part about this um, is that things started to spiral downwards, things were being found out, and he actually murdered two people in Utah. And I can almost guarantee you that if you defraud the Mormon church and murder people in Utah and get caught, you are never ever getting out of prison. 
But right now there's a three part documentary on Netflix. It just opened this week called Murder Among the Mormons. If you wanna see more of it and there's so much more behind the scenes, but so you, you never know what you're gonna get into with these things. And, and it's, a lot of times it is the people and the characters. I remember when I was um, a young, in my teenage years, I was a big baseball fan. Matter of fact, I still am a big baseball fan. And this year has been a bit of a disaster, but regardless, uh, there used to be a man who came in our store, whose name was Mo Berg. Uh, he actually was a catcher for the Boston Red Sox, but he had such, he loved books and he used to come in and he'd show up every two or three or six months. And we, my father and I would go out to dinner with him. And, but not only was a, he a baseball player, but he had graduated Princeton summa cum laude. He was one of the founding members of the American Linguistic Society. And when baseball went to Japan, he broadcast in Japanese. In other words, with Babe Ruth and all these, he brought, but he also went up to the tallest building, which was a hospital in Japan and photographed all of Tokyo to bring it back because there was indications that there might be tensions and wars. This was in the early thirties. And during World War II, he was a spy. He literally could speak German so well that they flew him in behind the lines and he dressed up as a German officer and he could speak Northern German, Southern German. So he could get by in his, uh, his he remembers sitting, telling us at dinner, his mission was to figure out if Heisenberg, who was the main scientist, was inventing the atomic bomb. And if he was, he was supposed to assassinate him. He found out he wasn't. The United States pulled him out of the, uh, Germany quickly because he knew too much about the Manhattan Project. But you're sitting there talking to somebody. I was still more impressed that he was a baseball player at one time. Uh, but so you never know who you're going to meet. And, and sometimes it's the it's the people in, I remember one time there was a, a customer of ours when I first started in the store in the early seventies. And, and this is sort of an indication to say, you never know who you're talking with. You never know who you're dealing with. So treat everybody well. When he was a student at Harvard, he used to come in the store and he told me his father, my father always treated him well. And when I, first came in, he knew I got into work fairly early. He said, can I come in early? He worked at this small bank in North Carolina <clears throat> and he would call up and said, I have to go to New York, but I can take an early shuttle, get in, see the books. I said, fine, come in. He was a nice guy, actually a wonderfully nice guy. And as he, as the years went by, he was a vice president, but everybody at the bank's a vice president, then a senior vice president, executive vice president. Then the bank merged. And then he was president of Bank of America. And he used to still call me up and say, can I come in early? And uh, so on. So you never know the, the Bank of America president was calling, yeah, you can come in. And, and what I'd like to encourage people though, is if you're looking for books, if you wanna collect books, do it something that you like and enjoy because the real fun of it is the hunt, the search, the meeting the people along the way, getting to know the booksellers, getting to know the other collectors, getting to whenever you're driving out on the road, stopping at this antique show, going to the local bookstore, going to the uh, Goodwills and all of that. And you never know what you're gonna find. And as people always wonder when I'm buying things, am I being taken advantage of? Or when I'm selling, do I, know what I'm getting. And, and what I say is, yeah, maybe once in a while you are. Uh, but as you learn about a subject, as you do it more, as you meet people who can help you uh, in the <coughs> trade who you know and like, you'll probably know more about what your area of collecting is than the people, the dealers, the other are. And that makes it a lot of fun. And the other thing that I always tell young dealers or young collectors, when they ask me about making mistakes, getting, you know, gee, did I overpay for this? And I always say the biggest mistake 
if you've told me you've been collecting for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the biggest mistake you can tell me is never making a mistake. Because if you have never felt you've made a mistake, what it means is you've been so conservative that you've never, you've probably passed out so many things that you should have bought that you don't know that you made a mistake just passing them up. So be aggressive, you know, do it with knowledge. But many times it's the thing that you think you were overpaying for a thing that 10 years later, you, you say, I'm really happy I get this. And matter of fact, one of the things I have some collectors who have been looking for certain items or books for 20 years, 30 years, you know, it's always out, they find them and they're really disappointed because now they don't have to look for it anymore. Uh, of course, anyone who's done that usually has many more things than you uh, uh, have, you know, so that they're looking for. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier that um, I don't really collect books. And one of the reasons I don't is when I was growing up, my father used to bring home four, five, six books a day. Do that for 40 years. And you can imagine what our house looked like. He always meant to read a, a, a subject, uh, maybe an introduction, whatever. I read a lot. I read a lot about books. I read a lot about book collecting, but I tend to read them, then bring them back. But there's a certain collection that I started. There were books before they had dust jackets widely in the late 18, early 1900s that had very decorative covers. They were just nicely done. And the reason they were nicely done like that the publishers figured that if they caught your eye when you walked in the store, more chance you'd buy them. And you can get them very cheaply. You can go to yard sales. Individually, they don't seem like much, but as a collection, they can be graphically really good. One day I got a book, had a picture of a toilet on the cover. The title of the book was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper, Who Invented the Toilet. Took it home, showed it to my wife, she took one look at it and said, we have to put that in the bathroom. A couple of days later, I got another book, had a big eye staring out of the cover. The title was We Never Sleep. It was a history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, but with a big eye staring at you, I thought, ah, put that in the bathroom too. Now this is a little half bathroom, so there's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves and now we have three or 400 of these Victorian style illustrated books in the bathroom. People walk in, they're a little taken aback, loads of reading material. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable because every once in a while a book falls off the shelf and you can imagine where it ends up. Uh, but it, it's a lot of fun. Now, I can go on and on and on with stories uh, and you never know what people are looking for, but um, we have, and that's again, a lot of times the customers, we have one customer who comes in almost every day and he actually calls in sick when he's not coming in. This isn't an employee. This is an customer. He calls in sick. And, uh, the reason he does that actually, uh, is he's always afraid that that day something will come in that he wants and we won't know that he's not coming in and someone else will buy it in the meantime. You also get unusual customers. We have uh, one lady who comes in, she's very, very nice, but she eats Bibles. I mean, literally she eats Bibles. She'll go and rip out a page and eat it and take in the word of God. So she obviously has some issues, but she's such a nice woman. And she, but she eats Bibles. And matter of fact, a lot of people don't know it, but on our street in West Street, it's a very small street, but a few doors up from us, there's a convent and they sell religious articles and goods. And they actually keep a Bible for her. Now she'll only eat the Douay Bible. She only eats Catholic Bibles, not the St. James, it's not good. Uh, but they keep one for her so that they don't lose too many Bibles. So, you know, but you meet all sorts of characters and people. Um, what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna tell one story. I have a story to end with, with Bibles, but uh, a lot of times, you know, you think the things you remember are the really fine things, the really great items. And those, I definitely do. Um, 
in the unusual things. We one time went into a library and this was a library that I had been after the collection for 35 years. And the collection had gone and moved and moved and they didn't have the money to, to keep it up. And I went with my manager about 10 years ago and it was the whole collection had been moved to a janitor's closet under a sprinkler system with all the cleaning products around. And I told my manager, they have some nice things here. And she was there and I said, oh, would you like to see a, a, a page from the Gutenberg Bible? And so it was under a pile of stuff, pulled it out and there's a page from the first printed book in 1456. That page was worth about $50,000. But so you don't, on the other hand, we had a collection of cookbooks. I bought about 2000 cookbooks. Some of them were rare and valuable. And there are people who collect almost any subject area field you can think of. But I bought about 2000 cookbooks, some very rare, valuable, high priced specialty. But then there was a whole bunch of these little pamphlets, like how to use a mix master, uh, how to make jello, how to, uh, uh, one of my favorites is Baker's Chocolate Company. Uh, because when I was growing up in Dorchester in Boston, the Baker Chocolate Factory was about two miles away by air. And if the wind blew in the right direction, everything smelled of chocolate. And our mothers, I think, went nuts because we all wanted chocolate. But in any case, uh, I said, take all those pamphlets, put them in a box, put them on our dollar table. <coughs> There's some bargains in there, but we've got some great things here and the time isn't worth it. About two hours later, a man comes running in. He has a pamphlet in his hand and he's just absolutely beside himself. He's so thrilled. He goes, I've been looking for this for years and years and he, the joy on his face. And I look at the pamphlet and the title is Coconuts and Constipation. <laughs> so you never know. And uh, in any case, like I say, I can go on and on and there's a million stories, but one of the things that I do that I've been doing for about, I guess it's 20 years now is the Antiques Roadshow. And I hope you all watch it. I, it's, they're a lot of fun to do. Unfortunately, COVID messed up this year, but one of the great things about the Antiques Roadshow for me is my wife comes with me on most of them. And we usually can go a few days early or sometimes a week early. And anywhere you go in this country, I don't care where it is, if you make any kind of effort, it's beautiful. There are great things to see and the people are wonderful. Don't talk about politics and religion, but anywhere you go, I mean, why would I ever go to Boise or Fargo or uh, Omaha or, and we've been all over, but it's just wonderful. But the show itself is a lot of fun to do because there's about 75, 80 appraisers that do every show. I mean, at every show, there's about 200 appraisers in all. Not all of them do all the shows. I usually do half to two thirds of them. And you go out to dinner, you see people, you become friends. The crew comes out of Boston. So a lot of them I, we see on the planes going back and forth. But the way that show works is you appraise usually on a day. It used to be a Saturday. Now, sometimes it's a weekday and you're at a museum or a convention center and you appraise on a Saturday from about seven o'clock in the morning, 7.30, sometimes to six, seven at night, almost straight through. And there are three book appraises next to the music appraises, next to the jewelry appraises, next to the posters and whatever. And uh, all day long, you're appraising. Now, a lot of people don't realize that we pay our own way. Public television is public television. They don't pay for travel, expense, hotel. Uh, they don't pay for uh, meals or anything. But what we get out of it is first of all, the fun of doing it and the good public relations out of doing it. <clears throat> but at each show, there's probably two to three, well, actually three to 5,000 people come to a show, which is why this year, We've, uh, we haven't been able to do it. And each person brings two items. So there's about six to 10,000 items that come to a show to be appraised. And 
what happens is you appraise all day long, almost nonstop, and hopefully you get something in that is good enough for television, either the story, the price, the value, the person who brings it in. But you can pay your way there, spend a whole day appraising and not have anything come in that's really good enough for a TV spot. So one of the things that happens, and a lot of people don't realize this, all the appraisers want to be on TV too. I mean, we want to get our spot and it's not guaranteed. And, and it's not like they've set things up ahead of time that you know what's coming in, it's by chance. And the ideal day on Antiques Roadshow for an appraiser is, the show opens at 7.30, someone at eight o'clock comes in, you go, you look at it and you go, this is fabulous. And they don't know everything there is to know about it. So there's a story to tell. There's, you call a producer over, the producer says, yes, this is great, film it. And then by nine o'clock in the morning, you've already filmed. And that makes the whole rest of the day go fine. Whereas if it's three, four, five in the afternoon and you haven't filmed, you get very anxious and nervous. Am I gonna get anything? Is there, you know, so usually you do, but I remember there was one show and, and they, this was an item that never made it to TV. But a man comes in, it was in Kansas City, and he comes in and he has a few things from Pope John Paul uh, when he toured the United States in the 70s, nothing really special. Uh, but then he pulls out a bunch of photographs. And it turns out this man was the pilot that flew the Pope and his entourage all around the country. And he had lots of stories about the entourage and the people and the things they did and the Pope. And there was one photograph I'm looking at, and this is, I'm saying to myself, this is getting better and better and better. And the pilot is sitting in his pilot seat in his pilot uniform. And the Pope in his full vestments is literally standing over the pilot seat with one foot in the air, his arm reaching out and signing the pilot's Bible. And I'm going, this is fabulous. First of all, usually when you see the Pope, He's standing there, people kneel, kiss the ring. It's very formal. And there he has one leg up in the air, reaching over, signing. And I go, this is fabulous. Let me see the Bible. He goes, oh, I didn't bring that. And I'm going, can you go get it? And he goes, no, it's in a safe deposit of the banks. And I'm going, ah, because this was the perfect uh, appraisal. But Antiques Roadshow is a lot of fun. I hope everybody watches it. Um, you know, I. Hopefully, maybe in the fall, they'll be able to get out again. But there are so many stories that can go on. I'll tell you what, we've gone through about 40 minutes. I don't know if there are any, uh, what I'll do, I'll tell you what, at this point, I'll do one or two of the appraisals that people have sent in ahead. Now, one of the things I'm definitely gonna say is, I can do one or two or three appraisals. Normally, if we were doing this live, which maybe a few years from now, we'll do another one. I'll get to go skiing too. But uh, um, I picked a few that aren't necessarily the most valuable, <coughs> but they're things that can talk about a little. And then we can maybe do some questions. Uh, there was a, a woman who sent in an appraisal. Oh, she, uh, her name was Eileen. And she had a copy of Walden uh, by Thoreau. Now, Walden's a very collectible book. It was first done in the 1850s. Her copy was from 1902. And I looked at the pictures she sent and it was from a library. It was from Colby College Library. So first of all, I would, would have a little question about, did, is there a discarded sticker stamp somewhere on that or was it from Colby College Library? But the condition wasn't good. It's maybe a $5 book at best. It, it's probably a library book sale. And hopefully that's where it was gotten from. But there are people who collect books. And usually when you think of book collections, <laughs> you think of they're collecting an author, they're collecting a subject, they're collecting maybe an area or a field. But there are people who collect a book. And we had a customer when I first came with my father, he had been a longtime customer, and he collected Walden. Literally, he had 3,000 copies 
of Walden, different copies, different editions, different languages, different colors of the bindings, even if it was the same language, uh, different little inscriptions in them, not necessarily from Thoreau, but he had literally 3,000 copies of Walden from the 1850s till about the 1980s when he died. And he was always looking that there might be another copy. So people can collect a book. And it was a fascinating collection. It ended up at a Walden Museum. I had another person one time call me and they had 1,500 copies of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Uh, I bought the collection, but that was just barely touching the surface of how many different copies are of Ruby out of Oma Khayyam. Some of them are worth almost nothing. Others are worth thousands of dollars. Another author that people collect a book of a lot is Alice in Wonderland. All the hundreds of different copies. So just by sending in a, uh, a Walden that's worth a few dollars, I get to talk about people collecting a book. Uh, another person sent in a, uh, a, a 10 volume set of the photographic history of the Civil War uh, as a Matthew Brady's photographs. This is a 10 volume set, his had some damage to it. So it's a fairly common set, probably worth about $50, perfect condition, worth about $100. Uh, uh, three or four hundred dollars. And it's been reprinted many, many times. And the reprints are out there. But one of the things is that set has gone down in value a little. And one of the reasons it's gone down in value is up until about 20 years ago, if you wanted to see those photographs, you really had to have the books. You had to go through them. You had to look at them. And and that's where you got one of the best ways of seeing them. Now with the internet, almost all of those photographs are reveal, available for free on a computer screen. So the book that that person was buying for the information has gone down in value because you don't need that for the information anymore. Now a collector of the Civil War still might want one in their library, but the people who wanted it because they need the information the prices have gone down and the internet has done that to a lot of things. How many people have bought dictionaries or encyclopedias recently? Uh, but it goes way beyond that. Uh, art books that used to sell for a lot of money have dropped in value. The reason they've dropped in value is if you wanna see a picture of Leonardo da Vinci that he painted or Picasso or Rembrandt, again, it's out there. I even had a friend of mine come in, he had just retired. And he said, you know, I've retired, I wanna start playing tennis again. Do you have any good books on how to play tennis? And we looked, there were a couple, and he said, you know, YouTube's better. And the reality is YouTube is better because you can actually see the stroke, you can see people doing things. So almost any book that people bought, uh, years ago for just purely information, a lot of those have dropped tremendously in value because the information's out there and it's free and it's on the internet. The other thing the internet has done in bringing down values is a lot of books that used to be quote rare were actually just hard to get. In other words, if you went into a bookstore and you saw a book there and you say, it's a little overpriced, but I might need it two years from now and I'm, I don't know that I'll be able to find it, you'd buy it. Now you go click, click, you find there are 50 copies out there. And, the, and because there are so many copies, the price has gone down on a lot of them. So they're cheaper, but even beyond that, from a bookseller's point of view, you say, well, wait a minute, if there are 50 copies out there, I don't need to buy this until I really need it. And in most cases, you turn out never really needing it. And so a lot of things have gone down in value. Now, one thing I will talk about values, a lot of people will come to me and they say, I've looked this up on the internet. Now, one of the first things I hope when people do that, just I say to myself is first of all, I hope that it's the actually the same book that they have that they've been looking up. But the other thing is they might have found a hundred 
copies of it that range from $5 to $3,000. And there's no real difference. And all they tell me is, well, it's on the internet for $3,000. And I, you know, sort of have to sometimes bring them back to reality. And when people are looking on the internet, one of the things that I always suggest before you ever look at price, look at how many, is if there are 20, 50, 100 copies available, then that means there's 20, 50, 100 copies that haven't sold at whatever price they are. And to sell things on the internet, because this comes up a lot. My wife, when the internet first started, said there's only three ways to sell a book on the internet. You have to have the best copy, the only copy, or the cheapest copy. Mm. Uh, other than that, they're, they're, that's all it's going to sell. And um, But one of the great things the internet has done, and I will suggest this to people, uh, since I can't do a lot of appraisals here, uh, one of the great things about it is people call me now with a book and I say, send a digital picture. Because a lot of times for a digital picture, I can easily give you an idea whether to appraise it. Or sometimes people say to me, I just inherited my father's, mother's, uncle's, friend's library. We have no idea there's 500, 1,000 books. I say, look, if the books are on a shelf like this, take a picture of the shelf. Or, or sometimes you can get two pictures. Make sure they're in focus. That's an important part. And a lot of times, just by me looking at the shelves, I can tell people, yeah, this looks like a valuable library. I'll make an appointment and come out. Or if that's typical of it, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, do whatever you want. Or I'll say the third book from the right on the second shelf down, we need more information about that one. And the pictures are actually better than lists. And the reason is that I can look at them and I can see the condition. I can see what edition it is. So the internet has provided a lot of information that way. And what I tell people, it's the internet is just different. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just different, it's a tool. Why don't we see if there's some questions uh, and I'll take and do a few. And like I say, anything that I haven't gotten into, if you've mailed in, uh, I will get back to you privately tomorrow or the next day. If you have questions that you don't get through tonight, call me, email me, but I'll answer them all. And I always respond in two business days. And if you don't get a response from me in two business days, it means I didn't get your email. In any case, what do we have a couple? Well, I just happen to have had the, the privilege of coming across some of the, the, the books that um, might be sent your way for consideration. And I have a hankering to know about one in particular. I'm wondering sure. about the Confederacy of Dunces. I think that one you might have taken a look at and um, very yeah, curious there was about a, that. Someone had emailed in. They actually had a Hunter Thompson sign book. They had a Tolkien sign book. <laughs> Um, they had Confederacy of Dunces, and there was one other, um, I'll remember it. Uh, but the Confederacy of Dunces was a book that came out, and it, you know, it was a first, it was not anything special when it came out, and it became a great classic and so on, but nobody really paid much attention to it at the beginning. And when books come out, especially when you're looking for value in authors, usually early in their career, the books are more valuable because nobody's really paying attention. Mm. And the other thing about uh, value on books, especially modern first editions, and when I say modern, I mean 20th century, if they have a dust jacket, that dust jacket has to be perfect to get the absolute top price. I mean, it's, it's very, one little nick, one little tear can make a huge difference. And then this is was also a signed copy. It's probably in the three to $5,000 range is what a, a retail, if it's absolutely perfect, it might go a little higher. If I looked at it closer and I saw a little nick or a fading, it might drop a little. But people who collect and are willing to pay a price, the ones who can afford it will pay absolute top price for the very, very best. And you can almost ask what you want within some reason. But the minute you have to say, this is a great copy, but 
is a little nick, there's a little sun fading, mm -hmm. that price can drop 70, 80% or more sometimes because people, when they collect, it's a lot of it is prestige. It's being able to say to your friend, look, I've got the best. I've got the most wonderful. Essentially, I have the copy you don't have <laughs> and look at my great collection and they'll pay for that prestige. And that's part of it. And uh, so, but that one, the Confederacy of Dunces is probably in that three to $5,000 range. And it, it looked like a very, very good copy. Mm, great. Well, I have a question here from William. It is, so what books have gone up in value? It sort of is paired with what you're just talking about. I find myself really valuing books that are real beautiful objects with good typography, engravings, et cetera, just because it's the experience you can't get in an ebook. Well, I have to admit, I when I read books, I like to read the book. Um, ebooks don't quite do it as much for me. But on the other hand, now when I go either to an antiques roadshow or I go to an estate, I carry my iPad with me. And I probably have a thousand different reference books on that one iPad. I could never carry those with me, you know, when I was going before. So the ebooks have their purpose and their function. But every reason you mentioned in that question, either typography, binding, mm. design, illustration, uh, or what I was remember, my bathroom collection, that's all the design of the covers. It's not necessarily what the book is. So every one of those reasons, there are people collect books, either maybe a particular designer, a particular publisher, a particular illustrator. Uh, and uh, in the touch and the feel and the holding, I mean, that's what it's all about. And when someone's collecting many thousands of different copies of something like Walden, there are a few copies that are just so gorgeously, the book themselves are works of art. And yes, people collect those and uh, appreciate it. The, the one problem sometimes though, when you have that perfect copy, that perfect book, maybe the absolutely most gorgeous copy is you almost need to buy another copy of it. I, have, I had a friend who collected Dickens and he had a fabulous collection of Dickens, beautiful first editions in the original bindings. He used to go out to my dollar tables and buy a copy, and that's the one he read, because he you can't he could he was afraid to read the really perfect copies. Or what another thing that a lot of collectors I know do when a new book comes out by an author that they really like, they buy two copies, one copy they put in glass scene and put in a glass case behind you know all sorts of secure out of sunlight perfectly protected, maybe in a protective box, and the other copy they read. <laughs> you know, because, you know, that's part of the whole thing of collecting. And I many times question, we had a copy of uh, Make Way for Ducklings. Mm -hmm. First edition, absolutely perfect, untouched. I mean, as good as you can possibly get it. In the two types of books that are the hardest to get in good co condition are children's books partly because of who reads children's books. The other is cookbooks because of how they used. But this was a make way for Don, absolutely. I mean, you could not, if you had bought it new from a store, you couldn't get better. The price on that was $20,000 and we sold it. And, I, and partly I'm thinking to myself, which is really more valuable? This absolutely pristine book that I just sold for $20,000, which I was thrilled about, the person who bought it was thrilled, or the other one that I had that had crayon marks in it, mm -hmm. there were some rips in the pages and torn, and it was very obvious that either some parent or some child had read through this over and over and over again, mm -hmm. uh, which is more valuable. And, and I actually got a question, see how I can go off in tangents when mm -hmm. people, People one time sometimes ask me, what's the most valuable book that you've ever had or, or gotten? And I will say that there's a colleague of mine who does the Antiques Roadshow, and he one time answered this question, and it rang a bell for me. So I stopped, Tom, I thank you. I, I, I asked him first, I said, can I steal this answer from you? But 
you know, it's not the signed Isaac Newton that's worth a million dollars or the uh, the hundred thousand dollar book on American Indians or this. When my kids were growing up, I have two daughters, they're both in their thirties now. I used to read to them and one daughter in particular, we read right up until she said, dad, enough. She was 12 years old. The other daughter was more visual and she liked things like I Spy. But every Christmas Eve, I read to them the night before Christmas, the same copy, the same one. And my older daughter, who's the one who a little bit more into literary and so on, every Christmas Eve, I read it in that book. She's in her mid thirties now. Every Christmas Eve, I still have to read to her the night before Christmas in that book, in that edition. Now I also do it to her, her son. And it got to the point even where her husband's from Texas and they went to Texas a few times for Christmas Eve. Back, uh, I had to do it on YouTube so that she could click in and hear me reading it. And now with FaceTime, I have to do it. If she's away from the area, I have to read for that. That edition in that particular book of the night before Christmas is, in my opinion, one of my most valuable books. Well, that's funny because that that does tie into a question. There was the question, what is your favorite collectible and how did you come upon it? Seems like everyone has a story. And indeed, just as you've described, that it surely does. It's a story. Uh, Another collection that we have that we don't have anymore is my wife had about a thousand books on jazz, which was ba basically when I first got to know her and I was dating her, I knew what I could bring for a present. I could get her a nice jazz book signed by Billie Holiday or something else. Uh, it, it, we had signed studio photos of jazz musicians. So those were a lot of fun. Uh, she ended up selling the collection because she felt that 10 years from now, nobody might know who half these people are. Uh, there's also a collection that I gave up once that was my father's collection. Now, again, he, he wasn't as much an, a, a collector as he was an accumulator. Like I said, he'd bring four or five books a day. So he just accumulated, but it wasn't a focus. But when he died and I was going through his estate, there was a box of if people know what the old studio photographs are, the eight by 10 photographs of the movies. And he had a box with a, a stack of them about this high, probably 500, maybe even a thousand. I'm going, what is, why did he have old studio photos? And then I started looking at them. Every single one of those photographs had a book in the picture. It might be the act of holding a book. It might be a book in the background and it might be a picture in the background of someone holding a book in the picture in the background of the book. But every one of these things had a book in the background that my father had accumulated. Now I ended up not selling, but giving it to a person who knew my father and liked it. I still sort of get, regret it. I, I, I almost wish I still had that collection. So when, when you remember what you collect and what it's more, with me now, I collect the stories, these sheets and sheets of stories about books and about book collecting. Uh, and I have as much fun with those and I do the podcast. Again, it's called Brattlecast. If you like the stories I've been telling, it's on and on. One of the recent ones that I don't think we have enough time to get into, uh, but I was a thief in a John Grisham novel. Uh, he did um, He did a novel recently about a book theft uh, and uh, if you get it, well, listen to the podcast. Yeah. I didn't know he was p portraying me as a thief. He didn't know me. He owes me a dinner. I haven't gotten it yet, uh, <laughs> but he said he, he would do it because I did talk to him. But um, anyways, uh, one last story I'll tell about Bibles um, and, uh, and then maybe I'll take one more question and, and uh, like I say, I do get to work at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a long days, but the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time, always has been, always will be. And we sometimes get five and 10 people a week would call with Bibles and 
in most cases, we have to say, if this is your family Bible, mm -hmm. sentimentally, it's priceless. Monetarily, maybe not so much. And there are valuable Bibles. So, uh, you know, it's always good to check. Uh, in any case, I got called to a large old church in Boston, uh, well over 100 years old. They had a huge library in the church, and they just wanted to know. They, if Over the years, they had accumulated any valuable books. And I spent a day there, and actually, it was fun. They had some good books, and, and I enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, the priest said to me, we have some more books in the basement. Can you come down? So I went down the basement, looked at the books. There was some nice ones. And then there was a closet in the corner. It was more like a small room. The priest opened the door front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. <laughs> and I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? He said, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw oh. away a Bible. So what happens? When a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible, they come and they present it to the church. He says, and what do we do? Can we graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That would just be terrible. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, Ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, great. But if all you're doing is taking your role, you're not really doing anyone a favor. Again, I can go on and on and on with different people who've been in the store, different books we've seen. But why don't we try one more question and then anything else people have, get in touch with me. I'll, uh, okay. One of the problems that you have when you ask somebody a question who loves what they do it's not getting them to answer you. It's getting them to stop. Oh. So in any case, one more question and then we'll uh, wrap uh, it up. Well, this has been so enjoyable. And yeah, I feel like we could just go on all evening. Um, but we have a question about what is the most common subject matter for book collectors. And could I say an and at the end? Because there, I'm, I'm putting actually two questions into that sure. that actually are not necessarily related. But maybe just speak a little bit about ephemera. Like collecting match matchbooks. I mean, these funny little things that you referenced it a little before. Or collecting know. studio photos from uh, yeah. from uh, or, movies. Or uh, how, how to use a blender booklets from yeah. sort of uh, whatever. Well, first of all, what what's the most common thing is there isn't the most common thing. I mean, the Bible is the book we get asked for. That's the most commonly printed. But no, everybody has different likes, tastes. Uh, so you think that you, you know, a lot of people will ask for just novels to read or so on, but no, the, there's the Civil War, there's World War II, but it changes. Uh, World War II used to be a big, big selling collection for us, but over the years now, probably a third of the houses and estates we get called to are selling books on World War II because it's the World War II veterans who bought them. Mm. Well, now they're selling them all or their states are selling them, but they were the ones who bought them too. So they don't sell as well, just demographically. What, what I find is some of the best selling collections is collections that have a lot of books on one subject or another. In other words, if when people call us the first question we ask them is, how many books do you have? And usually the first in answer is a lot. And then the second question is, well, what kind of books do you have? And the answer is fiction and nonfiction, which is every book ever printed. So we usually try to, you know, is it 50, 100, 500, 1,000? Uh, are there any special areas, fields, collections? Because if someone says, well, they collected a little of everything. Usually it's not a detailed co uh, collection. Whereas if someone says, I have 500 books on the history of skiing in Vermont. Well, that someone really made an effort to find 500 books on skiing in Vermont. And matter of fact, when you talk about, a, say I'm, I'm putting these two questions together. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you also say, well, within that collection, they collected the ski maps, the brochures, the hotel information, going back to the teens, the 20s, maybe the lift information, uh, the how to ski books, 
but also all the brochures and all the paper material that all these skiers and all the posters that went with them and all of that, that's all this, the paper ephemera that they put out that they, you know, you use it that day, you don't, or maybe that season and you expect them to get rid of it. That's what ephemera is. But if someone put together a collection of books like that, instantly you would probably have me in Vermont before they could hang up the phone or click <laughs> off the, because, and it's a lot of that paper goods that you don't see and it is harder to get in the collectors or that poster that went with it or the old maps that you know open up in the ski area and, and it's interesting because a lot of the skiers you look at Stratton which is close I ski a lot in I like Vermont but I also go to New Hampshire uh Okemo but if you look at maps from 10 15 20 years ago you see the main mountain and then if you look a year or two later you see wait a minute, the side mountain. And it's gone from 10 or 15 trails to 15 or 20 trails mm -hmm. to 100 trails. Mm -hmm. And the hotels and the support areas and the restaurants and what they served, all of that goes with the books and the ephemera. And, and so they all sort of go together for many people who collect. And you can say that about almost any collection. One last collection I'll, I'll mention that was sort of interesting. I got called once in the middle of February in a snowstorm to buy a collection of 500 books on parapsychology, which is an unusual subject. But again, the more unusual the subject, the more interesting it can be. And anyways, I get it. There was a big snowstorm. I get it back into the store, put it in the basement, didn't tell anybody about it. Big snowstorm that day. I think there was a foot of snow. I was in the store shoveling and, and then in, and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing. I hear you got a big collection of para, and then I got four or five calls that day. I'm going, wait a minute, this is parapsychology. Are the vibes going out all over the world? And <laughs> what it turns out was that I had outbid a couple of other dealers and they were disappointed they didn't get it, but they wanted to tell their customers, well, look, we didn't get it, but call him. So there was, there was more to it than the vibrations of the parapsychology going out. But almost any type of collecting that you get into, it's the stories that you remember. It's the one that got away. It's the people you met along the way. It's the different situations and how you got this and what's so special about that. I'll end, I'll end it on that. Uh, I'll hope that the pandemic end, or you can collect pandemic ephemera, all <laughs> of the wear a mask signs uh, or collect masks and all the different, that would make quite an interest. So, but even that, hopefully though, it will be a short lived time. You can get all the stuff on the pandemic mm -hmm. and maybe sometime in the future, I can come up, I can do another talk. We can do it live. I can do more appraisals, tell more mm -hmm. stories and go skiing. We <laughs> love it. We would just love it. Yes, come on back. And, Thank you. Uh, and bring your friends at the Antique Roadshow with you. We, we could set them up at the Riley Rink. We have a well, nice you know, you know, one, good parking. <laughs> one of the frustrating things about it this year, the show got, again, couldn't do it. I, two years ago, I moved from my house in Newton that my daughter now lives in to Copley Square. We, my wife and I got a small apartment. One of the Antiques Roadshow that was supposed to be this year was at the Boston Public Library. I live next door to the Boston Public Library now and I go, hey, this one's easy. No, <laughs> no planes. Well, I like to travel, but I can just walk next door. <laughs> we'll see about it. But yeah, the, the Antiques Roadshow, if any of you ever get a chance to go to a show, uh, mm -hmm. if you can get tickets, they're a lot of fun. And a lot of the fun isn't necessarily what you personally bring, although if you bring something you really want to know about, that's great. But while you're waiting in line, it's talking to all the other people in line and seeing the people. And, and again, we tend to do quick appraisals there because we have to get through a lot of people. But um, it's fun and you, you can meet them. And most of the people that you see on the roadshow, if you get in touch with them, they'll respond. Mm -hmm. Wow, that case. sounds like quite an experience. And thank you. And, and, and this and, evening and, was a great experience. So, and, and if 
And if you have a place in Vermont, a museum or thing that you think, email the producer of the Antiques Roadshow. We'll do. We'll we have looking for ideas. Bennington Museum that way, Shelburne Museum over here. And I'm sure collectively we could all come up with many more good ideas. Norman Rockwell Museum, a little bit of a trip, but that'd be fun. Well, Road trip they, for us. Or they, or they could do it at, um, uh, at uh, the Stratton Mountain. They could oh. do it at Stratton Mountain. They probably have big areas. I think that's because you <laughs> want to come skiing. <laughs> Well, no, that would have to be in the summertime, but I'd still like to go up there. In any yeah. case, wow. thank well, you very much. Thank, thank you everybody who tuned in. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. What a, what a nice way to spend our evening. And thank you. I've got to get to the bookstore. Right. I can't wait to be able to travel again. <laughs> well, we're, we're open. I know. And, and, you're, and you're open online. I invite everyone to check out the website, brattlebookshop.com. And the email address for Ken is there. He invites you to, to write to him and he will get back to you and with um, to those appraisals. And like it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you.